This is the second video in SBP's Recovery Navigation series. Let's talk about what to expect from the disaster recovery process, the general steps you'll be working through, and some of the resources, information, and programs that you will or may already be hearing about. It's helpful to have a view of the key steps that you'll be working through as part of the recovery process. First and foremost, taking care of immediate needs for yourself and your family. This is the first priority. Once your immediate needs are addressed and it's safe to return home, assessing any initial damage and calling your agents if you do have any insurance policies right away to begin the claims process. Next, you'll register with FEMA and any other agencies that may be currently providing disaster assistance in your area. You want to record and photograph all damage to your home inside and out or have someone help to do this for you. After that, you'll begin any cleanup that can be done safely and make temporary repairs to prevent further damage. You'll then begin researching contractors and soliciting estimates for repairs. You'll work with your inspectors and adjusters from insurance and from FEMA and from there continue to work through the claims assistance and rebuilding processes. The most important thing in the immediate aftermath of a disaster is making sure that you and your family's safety and basic needs are taken care of. You'll start to see, and I'm sure have already, information resources aimed at helping to take care of these. Your local government will provide information on when it is safe to return to the community if you've evacuated, if there are any curfews or travel restrictions in place, and any reports on damaged infrastructure, service limitations, boil water advisories, or other kinds of safety messaging. Your local government will also coordinate with health systems and nonprofits to make sure there are resources available to help meet medical needs. For example, if hospitals or clinics in your area were impacted, they'll be doing everything they can to make sure that mobile or pop-up safety clinics and other resources become available. If you have any medical needs, you can reach out to your local health department for more information. You'll also start to see information and instruction for debris removal. It's important to pay attention to scheduling as this service will be provided for a limited time only and you want to make sure you know your window for having items removed. Charitable organizations, many of which you've seen in the news already and those that will be continuing to arrive in the community over time, will also be providing services. In these early days, they will coordinate with local authorities to help meet immediate needs such as food. For example, organizations like the American Red Cross and Salvation Army often have fixed and mobile feeding operations. You may see trucks driving around in the area providing meals. If there are continuing shelter needs, to locate the nearest shelter to you, you can visit redcross.org. You can text SHELTER and a zip code to 43362 or you can also call 211. You may also start to see local points of distribution which are sometimes called PODs or pods being set up and these are locations where government and nonprofit organizations may be gathering food, water, clothing, toiletry items, cleanup kits, and other necessities to help meet immediate needs. Your local government's website, area Facebook pages, uh, and other local websites will often have good information as these become available. As conditions are safe to do so, you may also start to see service centers open up. These are sometimes called multi-agency resource centers, or MARCs, where many of these organizations will gather to share information about their services, enable you to register for assistance, and sometimes distribute supplies as well. FEMA will also open up disaster recovery centers, or DRCs, where you can go in person to apply for federal assistance and to talk through any questions that you may have or get more information about available federal programs. We'll talk more about these 
in the Federal Assistance video later in this series. Finally, utility companies will pro provide information about service restoration for any areas where outages continue. They'll also share information about how you can report any concerns around safety issues or utility hazards that you may encounter, as well as how to turn on or request service be turned on if it was turned off prior to evacuating. Remember, if your gas was turned off, always call the gas company to have it turned back on. Never turn it back on yourself. Another resource that's available year-round, day or night, is the Disaster Distress Helpline. If at any point you'd like to speak with someone or you could use some additional support in dealing with the emotional impacts of disaster while working through the recovery process, this is a resource that you can access. Once immediate needs are met, we're looking ahead to sources of funding for long-term recovery and rebuilding. The primary source is any applicable insurance coverage you may have homeowners or renters, flood insurance, or other relevant policies. By law, federal disaster assistance can't provide funds for losses that are already covered by insurance, so it's important to get started as quickly as possible on the claims process because FEMA will eventually need that information to make a decision on your federal assistance application. The two primary federal assistance programs that you'll see are FEMA's Individuals and Households Program, which provides limited grant funding for housing and other basic needs not covered by insurance with an aim to get homes back to a safe, livable condition. The Small Business Administration also provides support for not just businesses, but homeowners and renters after disaster in the form of low-interest long-term loans to help repair and replace damaged property, your home, your possessions, and vehicles where eligible. Depending on your location and availability, charitable organizations may also be offering some financial assistance, which is usually in the form of lower-value cash cards to help with immediate needs. Calling 211 is a great start to see not only what organizations may be able to provide supplies locally, but which may be currently offering aid programs. Be sure to check periodically as new programs and services will become available over time. In addition, other programs like disaster unemployment assistance may also be available, uh, programs that are administered by the state. Check with your state and local government on availability of other forms of aid. A good place to get started to see what programs might be available is visiting disasterassistance.gov and filling out this short questionnaire. It'll let you know what aid you may be eligible for and what programs to keep an eye on. Two of these state-managed programs are Disaster Unemployment Assistance and Disaster Food and Nutrition Assistance. If your employment was lost or disrupted as a result of disaster, you may be eligible for Disaster Unemployment Assistance. Check out your state's respective website for more information and pay close attention to the deadline. You must apply before the window closes. Disaster Food and Nutrition Assistance may be available for eligible residents to provide food benefits if you've been impacted by disaster. As with Disaster Unemployment Assistance, you must access or apply before the program deadline. For more information on available assistance programs, visit your state's respective website. With all of these programs, both governmental and nonprofit, the vast majority will require certain kinds of documentation in order to be able to apply for assistance. Gathering these documents together now can make it easier to apply as the programs become available later. Some of the commonly requested information include your social security number, typically the last four digits, insurance information, so about any policies that you have, and what kinds of claim settlements you've received. Financial information, so typically total household income, using pay stubs or tax returns to help verify. 
as well as information about disaster assistance you may have received from any other sources because most programs legally are not allowed to duplicate assistance you may have already received from someone else. You'll also often need to provide housing information that proves both where you lived before the disaster and if you're a property owner that you owned the property you're seeking assistance for prior to the disaster. So this may be in the form of a deed, or mortgage, a lease if you're a renter, and utility bills or some other similar merchant statement to show that you were residing at the property at the time of the disaster. And finally, many will ask for a list or documentation of the damages caused to your home by the disaster. So the degree to which you're able to gather these documents now or replace any that are missing will make it easier to apply to these programs down the road. Having a sense of the steps you'll be working through, actively seeking out assistance resources and programs as they become available, and gathering the information you're likely to need to apply to these programs will help move your recovery forward. In our next video, we'll discuss the insurance claims process and tips for working through it. As always, for more information about SVP, you can visit our website at svpusa.org. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us at training at svpusa.org.